Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Taryn Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Many people have claimed to see ghosts near the iconic Hollywood sign in California, but one particular ghost is seen more often than the others, and it comes with a sad story. Weirdo family member Andrew Horn tells of his ghostly experience in Gettysburg. Why did Nellie Bly intentionally check herself into an asylum for a harrowing 10 days? But first, statistically speaking, you will walk past a murderer 10.76 times in your life. But what if you didn't just walk past a murderer? What if they were a part of your family and you didn't know it? We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. These stories of the children of serial killers show just how well their parents hid their disturbing behavior. Some of these offspring of serial killers had an inkling that their parent was up to something, usually a general sense of something not being quite right. Others had no idea what was happening, sometimes under their own roof. May West, daughter of Fred and Roseberry West, had repeatedly spoken about the effects her parents' crimes had on her life. Between 1967 and 1987, Fred and Rosemary West murdered at least 12 young people, possibly up to 20, including Fred's ex-wife, Rena West, and two of their own children. The couple even buried several women beneath their shared home in Gloucestershire, England. Because of her parents' actions, May West feels that she can't work with children, explaining it's about self-protection as much as anything, because if something happened to a child in my care, if they fell and hurt themselves, I'd be blamed because of my background. She's also discussed her problems starting a new life somewhere else after attempting to relocate to Australia. They wouldn't let me in the country because of what my parents did, she said. And the treatment even extends to her husband, who may claim applied to be a policeman, but he couldn't get in, and she said, I'm sure it's because he's married to me. May alleges that as a child, she was molested by her father, raped by her uncle. She also says her father raped her sister. Looking back on her childhood, May realized that she and her sister, like most young girls, played dress-up with clothing they found in a house. They didn't know it, but the clothes belonged to their father's victims. She feels it's unfair that the police show concern about her family now when, in the past, we were overlooked by the authorities while our parents abused us sexually and physically as kids, and now as adults they say, you're from an abusive family, we'll have to keep an eye on you. May often visited her mother in prison despite what she did because she believed her father was the real culprit, but she thinks her mother manipulated her. She started to hug me and hold my hand when I visited her. She'd never shown me any affection before. She signed all of her letters, Love as always, Mom, yet she had never told me she loves me before. May soon realized that her mother was never going to answer any of her questions 
or take any responsibility. In fact, she had become quite high and mighty in prison, claiming my sister Louise wouldn't be a good parent, overlooking the fact that she and Dad had been responsible for violently and sexually abusing her. Fortunately, May has been seeing a therapist and remains focused on the future. She is happily married with an adult daughter and a young son. She's moving on with her life, but she is still haunted by the past. I can't bear to be cornered in a corridor or a room. I'm alert to all the awful stuff that can happen. She also has trouble connecting to people emotionally, saying that she cut off her feelings when her uncle abused her. She did it to protect herself, she says. She says, I'm practical. I'm very good at helping if one of my sisters needs her washing machine fixed, but if she rings up crying, I don't know what to say or do. Keith Jesperson, a long-distance truck driver from British Columbia, also known as the Happy Face Killer, raped and murdered eight women during the 1990s. Jesperson spread out his killings to several states, including California, Florida, Nebraska, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. Jesperson's daughter, Melissa Moore, revealed the strange relationship she had with her father. He never molested or beat any of us, she said. It was just a feeling that something was building, seething beneath the surface. I once tried to articulate it to a school counselor, but it didn't come out right. I mean, a lot of kids think their dad is weird. Moore revealed she also felt uncomfortable with her father's behavior around women. He would tell her details of his sexual exploits, leer at women in public, make lewd remarks about them and harass them. Moore felt at one point like her father wanted to tell her what he was doing, but ultimately said, I can't tell you, sweetie. If I tell you, you will tell the police. I'm not what you think I am, Melissa. Several months after that last meeting, Moore's mother told her that Jesperson was arrested for murder. Moore realized she had seen some signs of her father's deviant behavior, remembering a time when she found some kittens in a farmhouse and her father casually hung them up on the clothesline and began to torment them. I remembered his enjoyment as I screamed and pleaded with him to take them down. Later on, I found their little bodies in the back garden. She also remembered a time where her father told her he knew how to kill someone and get away with it. He started to tell how he would cut off the victim's buttons so there wouldn't be any fingerprints left, and he would wear cycling shoes that didn't leave a distinctive print in the mud. As an adult, she flashed back to that scene and realized they had been traveling through an area where he murdered a woman named Tanja Bennett, and he was most likely talking about her. I think he wanted to relive it and enjoy the moment again, she said. The effects of her father's crimes took a toll on Melissa Moore. Reading the newspaper became too difficult, and she didn't want to hear what people were saying about her father, even though she realized he was a bad man. She was in a violent, abusive relationship with a boy, something I think my father primed me for, she said. She was even isolated at school parents were really shaken up by the thought that their children might have been in harm's way, so they kept them away from me, and I began to feel tremendous guilt and shame. Fortunately, Moore was eventually able to move on with her life and even get married and have children. She cut off contact with her father after her grandfather revealed that, during a visit, Jesperson admitted to having thoughts of killing Moore and her siblings. Unlike most of the other children on this list, Matthew Ridgway remembers his father Gary Ridgway as a very involved and gentle parent who never raised his voice. The two went camping often, and his father taught him to play baseball. Even when I was in fourth grade, when I was with soccer, he'd always, you know, be there for me. I don't think I ever remember him not being there. Gary Ridgway, better known as the Green River Killer, started his deviant career in the fall of 1982 he killed dozens of sex workers in the following years. It seemed like the killer would never be caught until DNA technology allowed authorities to link him to a string of crime scenes in 2001. During the time of the murders, Gary converted his religion and preached Bible verses door to door. 
Ted Bundy later helped in the investigation by suggesting the police move their search closer to one of the sites the killer liked to dump bodies. Matthew Ridgway never believed his father was the Green River Killer, thinking, he's just one of the guys that happened to be one place and, you know, he's my dad, he didn't do it, you know? What Ridgway didn't know at the time, however, was that his father often used his son's photo as a tool to lure women and put them at ease before killing them. Gary also took Matthew to play near the Green River where he dumped the bodies of the women he killed. James Carson, a divorced father and alleged cannabis dealer from Phoenix, and Suzanne Carson, a divorced woman with two teens who spent her time at the local country club, met at a Thanksgiving party. The deadly duo killed between 3 and 12 people from 1981 to 1983, claiming witches, homosexuality, and abortion were what instigated them. Jennifer Carson, James Carson's daughter from his first marriage, saw things change a lot over the years. Suzanne, for one, was living this posh country club lifestyle before she started using LSD and got involved with my father, Jennifer said. Her father was seemingly normal before meeting Susan as well. When my mom met my father, he was a nice Jewish boy. No one could have foreseen this, especially how weird it got. Typically, your Jewish father doesn't convert to Islam, then to radical Islam and change it to some weird religion where they grow pot and kill gay people. Jennifer believed Suzanne had a lot of influence over her father, who tended to be a follower. If they had fallen in love with a televangelist, he would become one. If she had joined ISIS, he would have. He was that much of a follower. He was drawn to extremists, people he found really exciting. The couple's behavior grew more frantic and less rational. It's absolutely nuts they were dropping acid daily, Jennifer said. She did not know the extent of their depraved lifestyle, but she did recall an incident where she asked her stepmother to rub her back before bed, and she scratched my back and said that she was going to get the demon out of me. Jennifer was scared, and then Suzanne told her, you can fool your father, but I know that you are the devil and I'm going to get this demon out of you. When Jennifer finally broke down and told her mother about Suzanne and her father and what they were doing, her mother packed up and the two left for Southern California. In 1983, following the third known murder by the duo, the Carsons were finally apprehended, tried, and sentenced to 50 years in prison. In 2015, Suzanne was eligible for parole. Jennifer and others who opposed her release planned to testify at her hearing, stating, "...it's not vindictive, but it's for safety and accountability to the public. As long as Suzanne can lift a hand, she could harm somebody." In the end, Suzanne did not show up to her hearing and subsequently was not paroled. This was a relief for Jennifer, who said, "...she'll pass away in prison. She'll spend the rest of her life in prison, and that's what should happen." April Belasquio always knew there was something off about her father Edward Edwards. The family frequently moved, always in the middle of the night. He tell us that we had to move in secret because he was protecting us, because there were people who wanted to hurt him or us. April described him as hard to deal with at times, a Jekyll and Hyde persona. He could be very good with us kids. He was sociable, charming, but he could also be abusive. When he was abusive, it was hell. In March 2009, she felt an urge to check out cold cases in the areas that she lived as a child. While reading about a few cases in Wisconsin, she recognized a place called the Concord House, a wedding venue in Wisconsin where her father had been a handyman when they lived in the area. She realized the case, dubbed the Sweetheart Murders after a young couple who attended a wedding reception at the Concord House were murdered directly after, seemed very familiar. Velasco instantly knew her father was responsible. I was shaking. I was shaking because immediately I knew who it was that committed the murders, she said. Evidently, Edwards had taken the family to the park where the couple's bodies were found the day after their visit. The next day I knew there were ambulances and sirens everywhere. He had taken us to where their dead bodies were. Velasco shared her findings with the police and several months later, Edwards was arrested and confessed to four murders. 
An FBI cold case detective believes Edwards might have been responsible for several infamous murders, including the Zodiac killings and that of Teresa Hallback, subject of Netflix's Making a Murder docuseries. Edwards also allegedly killed his own son in 1996 to collect the life insurance. In 2001, Edwards received two life sentences and a death sentence. However, he died from complications of diabetes a month after his sentencing. Velasquez knows that she made the right decision about her father, but she is still racked with guilt. I live with two kinds of guilt, not reporting him sooner and possibly saving lives, and the guilt of turning in my own father. They're both strong. Kerry Rawson, she has a bone to pick with Stephen King. In September 2014, Stephen King announced a novella-turned-movie he had written inspired by Kerry's father, Dennis Rader, a.k.a. BTK, and his family. Rawson claimed King was exploiting my father's ten victims and their families. He's going to give my father a big head, and he absolutely does not need that. BTK, by the way, stands for Bind, Torture, and Kill, which was Rader's method of killing his victims over a 31-year period starting in 1974. He was arrested in 2005 and received 10 life sentences. Rawson remembers when one of her father's victims, Maureen Hedge, was murdered and how her father reacted. She knows he was not home the night Hedge disappeared. It was stormy and I didn't want to sleep by myself. My mom let me in her bed. That's how I know that he was gone. After discovering who her father really was, she struggled emotionally. I've never hated him. I was extremely hurt by him. I love him after all. He was my dad, so I was extremely angry and hurt. While in prison, Raider became angry that none of his family visited him. Rawson responded, You've had these secrets, this double life, for 30 years. We've only had knowledge of it for three months. We're trying to cope and survive. You lied to us, deceived us. Rawson eventually forgave her father and wrote him a letter. She told him about her life, her kids, and how she appreciated how he had raised her. She wrote, I don't know if I will ever be able to make it for a visit, but know that I love you and hope to see you in heaven someday. Rawson wrote a book about her experiences that will be released in January 2019. Merrick Kuklinski attended the 2012 film premiere of The Iceman starring Michael Shannon as her father, Richard Kuklinski. After the film ended, she approached Winona Ryder, who played Kuklinski's wife, Barbara, and remarked, "'If the character you played had been my mother, my life would have been very different. Good movie, not much reality.'" Richard, the Iceman Kuklinski, worked as a hitman for the mob and was responsible for more than 200 murders. He earned his nickname from his habit of freezing the bodies to disguise the time they were murdered. He also killed others whenever he felt like it. Merrick remembers her father as a generous family man, often behind the camera making home movies. If Dad was filming, he wanted everyone to smile, she said. We learned to take advantage of the happy moments. She describes him as a caring father, always there for his children no matter what. She spoke of an ideal childhood. He denied us nothing, she said. He wanted his life to be like it was on television. He just didn't know how to get there. But Richard Kuklinski had a bad temper and often would hit his wife and broke vast amounts of furniture in the home, which he regularly replaced. Merrick recalled how he even killed several family pets. I was late at coming home once and he took Princess and broke her neck. Princess was a Samoyed, not a small dog, he said I would never be late again, and I wasn't. Merrick hated going over a particular bridge in the neighborhood, as it seemed like an incident happened every time they passed over it. One Sunday, we were on our way to church, and another car cut us off at the bridge. Dad tore the driver's door off and beat him up pretty bad. And then we went to church, as if it never happened. Another incident occurred when Kuklinski beat up a motorist in the road in front of his kids. He gets back in the car and starts singing a song on the radio. I didn't say a word. When Merrick was about 10 years old, Kuklinski started to confide in his daughter, telling her he had killed people. 
At one point, he began to enlist her help. She never knew what was going on, but she felt it was probably not ideal. There were times when he would tell me not to look in the back seat or in the trunk, and I would drive him to some garage and pop the trunk, looking straight forward as he told me to do, while he would unload whatever it was. Kuklinski was arrested in 1986 and sentenced to life in prison. He died in 2006. Merrick, meanwhile, still deals with complicated emotions. What haunts me most is the reality that my father was a very, very sick, demented man. Between his own background as an abused child and the experiences that shaped his adulthood, the die was cast. Maybe if he'd gotten treatment, some or all of this could have been prevented. That thought haunts me every day. Many of the children of killers understand on some level that their parent committed murder. Katya, daughter of Mikhail Popkov, known as the werewolf and allegedly responsible for the deaths of 81 people, believes her father is innocent. Katya explained, Watch how a butcher works. He's covered in blood from head to toe. The women lay down meekly by themselves. I bet they would leave marks, bites or scratches. You cannot hide this. But my father did not have any suspicious marks on his body or face. Katya remembers an ideal childhood and feels the father she knew could not be responsible for so many murders. I do not believe any of this. I always felt myself as daddy's girl. For 25 years we were together, hand in hand. We walked together, rode bikes, went to the shops, and he met me from school. We both collect model cars, so we have the same hobby. She even cites her previous studies in criminology to vindicate her father. I wanted to be a criminologist, so I read a book with tips of how investigators catch serial killers, and there were also basic classifications about murderers. Daddy doesn't fit any of these classifications. He doesn't look like some maniac. Though Kachi claims she doesn't believe her father committed the violent crimes, she does admit to worrying her unborn son could inherit the maniacal inclination of his grandfather. Katya's mother, Elena, on the other hand, seems not to be picking sides. We cannot even think about this. We are shocked, and it causes us pain. There was no evidence in our family at all. We just want to know an answer if he did this or not. The Black Dahlia murder is one of the most famous cold cases in the United States. A beautiful young actress, Elizabeth Short, was found in a yard in Los Angeles, her body cut in half with surgical precision, the two pieces lying side by side. The case has never been solved, but Steve Hodell believes his father, Dr. George Hill Hodell, was responsible for her death and the murders of several other young women in the area. After Dr. Hodell died, Steve found a small photograph in his father's belongings, a young female nude with dark hair that very much resembled Short. Steve later learned the FBI kept a secret dossier detailing their suspicion that his father was the killer. A task force of 18 detectives was assigned to stake out and listen in on his personal conversations 24-7. The piece of evidence that pushed Hodel over the edge into truly believing his father was Short's killer was the handwriting. As he explained, it was done by a surgeon. Dad was a skilled surgeon. The next thing I find is handwriting, and I look at that and I clearly identify it as my father's. No question about it. Steve also found evidence connecting his father to the cement bags the killer used to transport Short's body. He was able to trace and place them at a Soudan Franklin house, our home, 1947, through dated receipts during the victim's so-called missing week. He only wishes he could ask his father about the killings. I would want to hear the why of it from his own mouth. Why'd you become a misogynist and misanthrope of the highest order? Why so many random killings? Why did you torture and brutalize young children? Tell me personally, what were the triggers that caused you to hate your fellow man so much? In 2010, Adam Carnes was framed for sending abusive text messages. The New Zealand native soon realized his own mother, Helen Milner, who was in prison for the murder of her second husband, Phil Nisbet, had framed him with messages so bad that Carnes was put in jail for 18 days. 
Carnes was devastated. The hardest part was the fact no one believed me. I mean, they just looked at me like, you're crazy, you're just being spiteful and malicious against her. After he got out of jail, Carnes wanted his mother to pay for her crimes. Carnes stressed that this wasn't a normal situation. No son would want to go out of their way to have their mother put in prison over something this serious. But any love he felt for his mother was taken away at trial. It was certainly made easier when, I mean, she looked at me in court and gave me this evil, sadistic grin. I don't consider her my mother anymore. Carnes wants nothing to do with his mother, even if she does get out of jail. In his opinion, she needs to finish her time and either get out and live a proper life or, you know, in turn, die in there, which, yeah, it's probably the best option, to be honest, for everyone. Later, Carnes brought a civil case against his mother, and Milner was ordered to pay him $55,000. Bobby Louise Belfield is the oldest child of Levi Belfield, a serial killer dubbed the Bus Stop Killer. He was responsible for murdering three women and attacking another in the London area between 2001 and 2004. Bobby Louise remembered a tough childhood and the abuse her mother suffered from Levi, who raped and beat her. He beat mom up quite a few times. I saw it happen. I felt scared and shocked. It was bad. It wasn't just a few slaps. It was more horrific than that. Levi Belfield's other daughters, Jessica, Hannah, and Janie, also remember the abuse their father, who insisted on his daughters calling him Levi, inflicted on them. After he and his wife broke up, Levi stalked the family. Jessica recalled, One time Levi came and smashed our windows, and we all sat together in the bedroom trying to comfort each other. I remember the curtains of my sister's bedroom being set alight. Another time he threw paint at our door. He had tried to run away, but he had trod in the paint so we could see his footprints going down to the end of the road. Bobby Louise recalled the day 13-year-old schoolgirl Millie Dowler went missing, and her father began acting very odd. He would never shout at me, but that night he was shouting at me to get out of the room. He was on edge. I was scared, thinking, why would he do that? Later, when they were in Levi's girlfriend's apartment, he refused to let Bobby Louise in his bedroom. There was something in there he was hiding, you could tell. At the time, I didn't think he had Millie in there. Now, I do think that. She also recalled her father's behavior around young women. He was always beeping at girls walking down the street. They were clearly in uniform. He would shout, oi, oi, and things like that. Jessica recalls the hard time the family endured when their father was arrested. People would walk up to us and shout, murderer, to our faces like it was our fault. Hannah got beaten up at school by three boys who locked her in a cupboard and gave her black eyes and a swollen nose. Whenever we complained to the teachers, it was us who were taken out of class, not the people who had done it. For Bobby Louise, there is no love left for her father. She will not visit him in jail and has said, I hope he rots in hell. I know it sounds harsh, but I really do. I don't ever want to see him again. Alicia Rose was four months old in 1984 when her father, Lindsay Robert Rose, who didn't live with the family, started his decade-long killing spree near Sydney, Australia. Rose went on to murder five people. She had no idea who her father truly was until she was nearly 13 years old and came home from school to see police there. I instinctively knew something was wrong, she said. Little did I know how irrevocably my life would change in the next few minutes. Alicia was horrified when she learned her father was accused of murder as I knelt on the mat in our lounge room watching the evening news. She and her mother were placed in witness protection. Her father's crimes had a lasting impact on Alicia. My father's actions have created horrific trauma, loss, and grief to their families, and that will be intergenerational trauma for those families. Alicia went on to study law and criminal justice. Life continued despite the upheaval, she said, except that I carried a secret with me everywhere. My father killed five people. But Alicia often felt herself struggling. The harder I tried to understand my father's actions and to make sense of my life, the more complex and intricate the puzzle became. 
She has found fulfillment, however, by working with various charitable organizations. But her father's crimes have made an indelible mark on her life. Up next, many people have claimed to see ghosts near the iconic Hollywood sign in California, but one particular ghost is seen more often than the others, and it comes with a sad story. Weirdo family member Andrew Horn tells of his ghostly experience in Gettysburg, and why did Nellie Bly intentionally check herself into an asylum for a harrowing ten days? These stories when Weird Darkness returns. Peg Entwistle was born in 1908 in a town named Port Talbot in South Wales. Unfortunately, her mother died when she was very young, and this resulted in her grieving father dragging the family to a new life in the States. Not long into their American adventure, Peg's father met a new love and had two sons with her, Robert and Milton. Unfortunately, tragedy was not finished with the Entwistle family, and Peg's father was struck and killed by a car on Park Avenue. The two young boys went to live with their uncle, but Peg turned down this offer because she wanted to find fame and fortune in New York. At the tender age of 17, she managed to make a breakthrough and landed a job with the Boston Repertory Company. She then went on to work in the prestigious Theatre Guild productions of Broadway. Robert Keith stole Peg's heart in 1927, and within months, they were married. Unfortunately, Keith was a lot older than Peg, and she knew very little about his past life. Peg eventually found out that Keith had actually been married before, and even had a six-year-old son. He never mentioned any of this before they tied the knot. Peg decided that the marriage was a sham and started divorce proceedings, but Keith managed to get into more trouble with the law. She put the divorce on hold when she bailed him out of prison, but started the divorce proceedings up again as soon as he was a free man. Peg managed to hit the stage in 1931 with Getting Married and Alice Sit by the Fire, two popular stage shows. Unfortunately, by 1932, the work had dried up, and Peg started to sink into depression. She was forced to move in with her uncle to make ends meet, and she then managed to pick up a stage part with Billy Burke in The Mad Hopes. Unfortunately, this stage show only lasted a matter of months before closing down. Peg's luck then seemed to change when she landed a part in Thirteen Women starring Irene Dunn. Unfortunately, the critics had a field day at the movie's screening and it ended up being re-edited. Peg slipped further into depression. On September 18, 1932, an alcohol-fueled Peg left her uncle's home and headed to Mount Lee. Once there, she climbed the slope to the famous Hollywood sign. She then left a suicide note with her coat and climbed up the ladder that led to the top of the H-board and threw herself off. She was only 24 years old. The spirit of Peg Entwistle has been spotted on numerous occasions since her tragic suicide. More often than not, she is witnessed by hikers and rangers in the Griffin Park area. The ghost resembles a young, attractive, and blonde lady in white that walks sadly around the area in 1930s clothing. A famous encounter from 1990 came from a couple of young lovers taking their dog for a walk. Suddenly, the animal started barking at a wooded area and a sad-looking lady in white walked out. The couple decided to follow the lady for some distance before she disappeared into thin air. Griffith Park Ranger John Arbogast has made numerous reports of encounters with the ghost lady in white, always around the time of midnight when he's on his shift. He believes that the scent of gardenias follows her around and indicates that she is about to make an appearance. 
Ever since I was young, I have loved ghost stories and American history. My parents loved it because it gave them the excuse to go to Gettysburg for family vacations. We ended up going twice. The first time I was 11 and the second time I was around 15. The first trip we went on ghost tours and wanted to have an experience, but it was pretty uneventful. The second trip is when these stories take place. Our paranormal encounter was not necessarily terrifying or shocking in any way. Instead, it's several small experiences that made me a true believer in the paranormal. The second day we were there, my dad and I decided to take a tour of Guinea Wade's house. She's the only civilian to have died in the battle. It's not a particularly exciting tour, but it was the late afternoon and we didn't have a lot planned. It was also right across the street from our hotel, so convenience was definitely a factor. We got to the house at around 4.30 and asked the man in the shop if we could do the tour. He said they were closing soon, but we could be the last tour of the day. The three of us went into the house and he began the tour. He quickly learned that we had been there before and decided that repeating the same tour he had done all day and we had done before was pointless. He asked if we minded if he went and closed up while we walked ourselves through the house. We didn't mind since we were just killing time. We noticed something this time that we hadn't noticed before. All the clocks are set to 8.30. We found out later that this was the time of her death. We went up to the second floor to look around, and as we went back down the stairs I got very dizzy. It was like I was punched in the face by the smell of roses. I looked for incense or a plug-in but found nothing. I asked my dad if he smelled it, but he hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. We finished up the tour and went back to the shop. The guy from before asked us if we were all done and we said yes. I decided to tell him about the rose smell. I asked, do you use some type of scent upstairs or by the stairs? His eyes widened and he asked me, what exactly did you smell? I explained the roses, and he smiled a little, almost like a I knew it type smile. He said that back in that time, women made their perfume using crushed up rose petals, and that scent is sometimes smelled upstairs. He said that people have also seen an apparition of an older woman when they smelled it. His guess was that it was Ginny's mother. We were both surprised and left both nervous and excited from the house. The story doesn't end there, however. Fast forward to around 9.30 that same night and we were driving around the battlefield by Devil's Den. My mom was with us and she began to get nervous because they locked the gates at 10 p.m. She said, we need to leave because we don't want to be stuck. My dad laughed and said, why are you in such a hurry? It's only 8.30. I turned around in shock and noticed he was looking at his watch, not the clock in the car. The two of us quickly realized his watch had stopped at the same time as the clocks in that old house, and we felt completely silent. We didn't talk about the Jitty Wade house for the rest of the night. The next morning, I woke up and my parents were scrambling to pack. We had to be in New York City by a certain time, and we were running late. When I asked what was wrong, my mom said that she had set the hotel alarm to 7 a.m., but somehow the clock's time changed after we went to bed. I'll never know what time it was set to or by whom, but I have a feeling I know what time it changed to. I know my story isn't particularly scary, but it made me realize something. If you go to Gettysburg looking for an experience, you may just find one. Nellie Bly was born Elizabeth Jane Cochran in Cochran's Mills near present-day Pittsburgh. She was a writer, journalist, inventor, industrialist, and charity worker. One of her more famous undertakings was a record-setting 72-day trip around the world based on the Jules Verne character Phileas Fogg from Around the World in 80 Days. What she is perhaps best known for, however, is pioneering an intensely committed form of investigative journalism by feigning insanity to get an inside look at a New York asylum. In 1887, 
After practicing deranged expressions in front of a mirror for a night, Bly checked herself into a boarding house under the name Nellie Moreno. That night, she purposely caused a scene. Bly refused to go to bed, exclaiming that she was afraid of the other boarders and thought they were crazy. She would later write that it was the greatest night of my life. Eventually, the police were called. When she was taken to court, Bly claimed she couldn't remember the night's events. She was then examined by several doctors, all of whom pronounced her insane. I consider it a hopeless case, one of them was quoted as saying, while the head of the insane pavilion at Bellevue Hospital said that she was undoubtedly insane. Bly was committed to Blackwell's Island, where she stayed for 10 days as a patient. She was eventually released thanks to an attorney from the New York World, the paper that had sent her there in the first place. Ten days, as it turned out, was plenty for Bly to write a scathing exposé about conditions in the asylum and the treatment of its inmates. The first installment of what would become Ten Days in a Madhouse ran two days after Bly's release, under the title Behind Asylum Bars. In it, Bly described oblivious doctors and orderlies who choked, beat, and harassed patients. She wrote of ice-cold baths, forced meals of rancid butter and cruel isolation. What, accepting torture would produce insanity quicker than this treatment? Bly wrote of her experiences on Blackwell's Island. In fact, from the moment she arrived at Blackwell's Island, Bly dropped her insanity act. Yet she found that this exacerbated rather than helped her position. The more sanely I talked and acted, she wrote, the crazier I was thought to be. Nor was she alone. Bly observed that there were many women at Blackwell's Island who were perfectly sane but had difficulty making themselves understood because they were foreigners. Take a perfectly sane and healthy woman, Bly wrote later, in her condemnation of Blackwell's Island, shut her up and make her sit from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. on straight back benches. Do not allow her to talk or move during these hours. Give her no reading and let her know nothing of the world or its doings. Give her bad food and harsh treatment and see how long it will take to make her insane. Two months would make her a mental and physical wreck. Bly's expose made an immediate impression, greatly embarrassing the doctors and administrators of the asylum. It led to increased funding and sweeping reforms at the facility. Within a month, Bly returned to Blackwell's Island this time as part of a grand jury investigation. The investigation found that many of the conditions that Bly had reported had been improved on or corrected. Bly's story also led to more stringent examinations of potential patients to ensure that only those who were seriously ill were committed. At the time, some journalists dismissed Bly's stint at the asylum as stunt reporting. However, her bravery and determination in exposing the truth forever changed the face of mental health practices, as well as investigative journalism. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at WeirdDarkness.com. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Children of Serial Killers was written by Stephanie Hammond for Ranker. The Hollywood Signs Lady in White was posted at RealParanormalExperiences.com. Ghosts in Gettysburg is by Weirdo family member Andrew Horn and was submitted directly to Weird Darkness. Nellie Bly's Living Nightmare is by Oren Gray for the lineup. 
Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And a final thought, you may think the grass is greener on the other side, but if you take the time to water your own grass, it'll be just as green. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.